Good morning. I don't want to break off interesting conversations, I'm sure, not entirely about Brexit, um, which indeed we may come on to, but not right now. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm Director of the Institute for Government. I'm delighted to have here this morning Sir Amos Morse, just stepping down after nearly 10 years as Comptroller and Auditor General of the NAO. And he's going to talk, about, uh, talk to us about the, the title which he's just um, given us. We I've just made up. Actually, I, I, think, I think you may have a may in that. We may have better things to do with the money. It has come out uh, in, yeah. a, in a more emphatic uh, form than I think perhaps no, you okay. intended. But um, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And you're going to speak for... Uh, not too long. Not too long. Just the right amount of time. And then I will... Uh, uh, ask you some we'll questions, and then there are going to be lots of questions from the audience here. Welcome to those on live stream as well. Amias. Thank you very much. No, no, I've, I've just made that uh, title up, and it's, it looks so much more decisive. I, it did have a we may in, in, it, in it, but I've been, I've been reliably informed that that comes across as a bit wimpy, so <laughs> there it is. That's, that's a contribution that the Institute of Government has made, and then let me thank you for that, Bronwyn, and also for hosting this talk and, and, and being here on stage with me, it's enormously reassuring to have you close by. And uh, I'd, also, I'd also like to take a chance to thank my colleagues from the NAO and also Public Accounts Committee in particular, I work with so closely, and the Select Committee uh, system and chairs who I also work with very, very closely. So that's my little trot round the ring. Um, as this is my last planned uh, public speech as CNAG, I have certain appointments to do something called giving reflections, which is a strange, it's sort of, a, it's an assumed twinkly style of reflective comment about over the years. But any, anyway, I don't, I'm not classifying those as speeches, whereas I'm actually am classifying this one as, as a speech. As this is my last one, I'm going to give a brief picture of how my thinking about the role of CNAG evolved in light of experience during my time in the job. Very brief. Uh, when I started this job, I was really struck by the range of powers that went with the office of CNAG. Uh, CEO of the NAO, complete discretion as to what I examined, access to any information I required held by government, the fact that I was a permanent witness at the Public Accounts Committee, and most important of all, the fact that I was an officer of the House of Commons, completely independent of the executive and funded directly by Parliament through TPAC. Somebody obviously thought that accountability for public money mattered, and I agree with that. Uh, two things became quickly apparent when I started work. Um, just by applying normal business uh, standards, or normal business practice standards, there was plenty to criticise about the way in which government went about its business from the standpoint of efficiency and effectiveness. And government really did not like being criticised at all. Or, if criticism there was to be, only in the most obscure terms. <laughs> I recall being informed that I was being disobliging, a word I'd never used before in my life, uh, when, I, when I did not replace the term poor bit Scottish, that, isn't it? Poor, to describe the performance, uh, instead of what the Permanent Secretary was asking me to say, which was, could have been better. <laughs> now, that is really a classic Mandarin phrase, and, uh, but I don't, unfortunately, speak Mandarin, and even now it's pretty rusty, despite a lot of my friends being, being civil servants. But I came to realise that it was, in fact, my job where necessary, and the NAO's job, to be disobliging and to point out inconvenient truths where necessary. And we've done this throughout my time uh, as uh, CNAG, uh, holding up a mirror to government to help Parliament investigate where things have gone right or wrong, or how government can provide better public services and make better use of our money. So we have a bird's eye view of over Whitehall expenditure and management, and that conjures up an interesting image. I don't know whether, whether I'd be better off being, being a, a drone or a bird, but anyway, we see some quite interesting things and not always the most pretty in the world. Uh, public money is, in my view, a finite 
So cost overruns in one place generally mean cutbacks somewhere else. And I still get angry, and that is the only word for it, angry, 10 years into the role, when I see badly thought through programs and wasted public value. And the reason I'm angry is because the citizen generally ends off picking up the tab. They are the ones suffering from the overambitious promises and, necess and necessary resulting cost shunting or backtracking. I wish I could tell you that this was all historical, but it's not. Just taking a few examples from the NEO's work over the past few months, Crossrail, the funding package, now 17.6 billion, including contingency, 2.8 billion higher than the one agreed in 2010, and it's possible that it may, we're assured it won't go further, who knows. Um, probation services reforms, an additional cost to, put, to try and put things right of 467 million projected uh, payments and underperformance on service to go along with that. Smart meters, NAO conservative estimate that the costs have risen, will have risen by at least 500 million to be paid for, let's note, by electricity consumers in the fullness of time. Now, I could go on with this. Well, one more. The 10-year, the latest version of the, ten, the MOD's 10-year equipment plan, we concluded it was unaffordable and not sustainable. And the forecast from the MOD is that it exceeds budget by 7 billion and could be more than that. Now I'm sure you can think of other examples but I have not had to reach very far to find these. I just said to my people, can you just pull off some of the stuff we've done in the last few months? And I think that raises some important questions. Um, and I thought we'd start with this one to try and make these telephone numbers a bit more real. I asked my NHS team to think about what could be done with one billion pounds. And the answer is, well, first of all, that, that's more than enough to run NHS England for three days. It gets you 6.25 million A&E attendances, four million ambulance attendances that involves seeing, treating, and conveying the patient to hospital, or 1.35 million day cases in hospital. Now, there's a lot obviously wrong with making the comparison like that, but it is just important to realize that we are making a choice. There is a prioritization here when we launch into projects which have very high risk factors which may go wrong. By implication, we're making a priority decision. So, in some, why does this happen? And in, the case, in some cases, it's simply that things turned out more difficult than expected. There was nothing to be done, and it's not unreasonable that people should have made the decisions they, they did, and that's life. And where that's true, we do testify to that. So it's not as if we expect everything to go perfectly, but I have to say, I have to scan very hard indeed to find any projects where the costs end off being less <laughs> than what was predicted. In fact, it's never that way around. So, so, so sometimes we see an optimistic scenario presented as the most likely outcome. Then we see things called world-beating projects. And as soon as I see that, my heart absolutely sinks. What, about, what, are, what could I be talking about? Well, the emergency services network to replace Airwave in the home office. That's coming in succession behind the previous world-beating project of e-borders, which went on for, I don't know, 12 years or something like that. Um, or Verify in the Cabinet Office, where team enthusiasm does not appear to have been offset by cool-headed expert challenge. Or the, or the recognition that things are just not taking off in the way they were expected. Sometimes it's aggressive, unrealistic timescales. We regularly report on projects that slip Universal Credits 1, Hinkley Point. You could say Brexit. When the Article 50 was triggered, was there any realistic idea of what could be done in, in the... We, we committed ourselves to a fixed time space 
Did we know what had to be covered, the ground that had to be covered in that time space? Let me answer that. I don't think we had a clue. So we've done really well, and I mean this, really well. I think the civil service has done really well to make the progress that they have made in this time. The fact that it was a very, it was an impossible ask, and they've tried very hard to meet it, I really pay them a lot of credit for that, and I'm going to say other positive things about the civil service as well. And sometimes, we, sometimes these projects go, we have these high-risk projects because of over-promotion of projects which turn out to be close to ministers' hearts. The consequences in simple terms of over-ambitious projects, poor decision-making and careless management is less money for soft spending areas, like public services that can be cut more easily. So, for example, in the MOD, it's a very old story that not enough is spent to maintain forces accommodation. In fact, at various times, they have been in a disgraceful state. This has gone on for years and years, so it's really concerning that this sort of thing can happen. And my point to you is, what goes around comes around. When you lose money in one place, it's taken away from another program. And generally, as I say, it's a soft program. So am I blaming this on the civil service? Well, you've already guessed that the answer to that is no. I think that there are still things that go wrong in the civil service. There's still plenty of badly managed projects. Um, I see examples where teams are so committed to the project, they believe that by sheer willpower they can drive it through, make it work, even though the indications are to the contrary. That's actually more common than you would think or teams where the culture gets so internalised, so strong, that they can't adapt to a change in the, in the political weather. Uh, then we saw some of that actually, interestingly, in our Windrush work. When, you know, if people are used to pursuing illegal immigrants, it's quite difficult to switch them over to looking after people who might have been unfairly prejudiced through that process. So I think there are issues there. But I have watched the professionalism of the civil service build steadily through the development of the infrastructure and projects authority, the project management academy, the increasing interest of accounting officers in improving outcomes. I used to be in a position where most accounting officers were in the, would see themselves as administrators and people who would argue that everything was a success and everything had been meant. Now what I find is that there's an increasing population of accounting officers who are in the business of improving the performance and who are prepared to be much more straight up about recognising findings and actually reacting to them, in private at least. So I think things are moving in a positive way and I also support John Manzoni's programme of professionalisation and building professional skills ac across government. I think all of that is positive and I think it needs to be complemented, however, with greater clarity about how that is all supposed to work <coughs> alongside ministerial decision making. The ministerial system was conceived on the basis that ministers would determine policy and the civil servants would implement. Um, and I would say increasingly we've got away from that. And I've fully, I, I, I well remember having conversations with Francis Maud and Michael Gove at the time, at the start of the Cameron government, where they told, they told me, and they, they weren't shy about it, that the problem was that civil servants were hold, it might hold back the drive for reform and the, the initiatives that they had already thought about for, for, for years in opposition and now were ready to, to, to put out. And in pursuing that, I think, in pursuing that ability to drive uh, change, I think the balance between, between the civil service and, and, and ministers has changed. It's changed quite radically. I also think, in addition to that, we see some ministers who see themselves more, more or less as chief executives, but without the qualifications to go with it. <laughs> and unfortunately, that means they get involved in taking decisions for which they should really be held to account, um, I think that's, that's, that's an issue. Uh, in, uh, on occasions, 
It appears that the intervention by ministers has led to the abandonment of good practice or expectation of achievement of unrealistic timescales. Given that civil servants generally see it as their role to defend their ministers and to take the blame if necessary, how does that work for accountability? I have had a look at the ministerial code, by the way, as a preparation for this, for this talk, and as far as I can see, it talked a lot about avoiding conflict of interest, but I don't think it said anything about value for money. And the reason for that is because value for money is the job of the accounting officer. But the accounting officer can only do that job if they're allowed to, if they're in a position where they're sufficiently influential to assert the importance of public value. So is the problem ministers? Well, I'm not saying that either. I'm saying it's, it's the interaction between ministers and accounting officers and the civil service. And I think that really needs to be addressed. Um, I don't think the relationship is where it ought to be at the moment, I have to be honest. And I think there needs to be a much more honest debate about that. Um, I think the, the appearance of the population of SPADs, the fact that, civil, that, that ministers have a say in the appointment of accounting officers, all these things have given them incre incrementally more and more power up against the accounting officer. Why is that? Is that, a, is that likely to produce a healthy result? And I think the answer to that is, no, I don't, I don't see it that way. I'm going to touch a little bit on secrecy and very marginally on spin. First of all, I think transparency is really important in public life. And after it's got its inconveniences, it's not instinctive to government, I know. But nonetheless, I think where we are transparent about issues, they tend to get cleared up in a positive way much faster than where we have secrecy. And I will say bluntly that I think the outbreak of secrecy that we've had over Brexit has not been a help. I think it probably, if anything, slowed down the ability of the civil service to react. And I also believe that it may well have help to create an atmosphere of distrust more widely and in Parliament. So I think that was, I think, I think going back to the old instinctive prejudice in favour of secrecy is something that government really needs to resist. I know we've got the Freedom of Information Act, but what you don't hear is anything in the political discourse anymore about transparency, and it really does, in my view, matter a lot. So, just one final thing on spin, and I, I, I really hesitate because we're so used to spin, you almost smile and say, well, what are you complaining about? This is just the way of the world. I, do, I can't help noticing, whenever we put out a report, that whatever our findings are, are juxtaposed against some not relevant but generally positive sounding statement from the department concerned. I think the, I, I, I'd probably give the Department of Health the, the top prize for, for, for asserting something. You say, you know, there aren't enough, there, are, there, aren't, there, isn't, enough, uh, there isn't enough imaging equipment, uh, and they say, we're spending a record amount on something completely different. And, you know, it, is, it does not help the quality of the discourse, and I think over time it's corrosive. So even though it's, you know, I think it's quite funny too, I think there's something to be said for it. So just in it's something to be said, said for reducing it. So just in conclusion, you can only reduce the incidence of failure in projects or massive cost overruns in projects and get better control of resources if you raise professionalism in the way services are delivered and how decisions are taken. It sounds really boring, but it's true. The more professional the approach, the more planning, the more skills, the better management information, the clearer the evidence, the less space there is for arbitrary, ill-supported decision-making. And I really, that's the way we have to go. The civil service has improved. I'm going to mention John Manzoni positively twice because I gave him a very hard time on the Verify report, so I'm trying to make up a little bit of ground there. But there needs to be a rebalance between ministers and accounting officers, ministers and the civil servants, and I believe that debate needs to take place, preferably mostly in private if that's what they need, and then in public. 
But there still are instances, I see, of inappropriate bravado when it comes to spending taxpayers' money. And that results in involuntary prioritisation away from things that might be where the money could be better spent. We don't need... We need big, brave thoughts backed up by professional implementation skills. We don't need people jumping out of an aeroplane into the dark with a parachute of taxpayers' money. <laughs> That's where my phrase comes in. I think that when that happens, we might have, we might be able to think of better things to do with the money than use it just for a parachute. Thank you. Anyways, thank you very much indeed, John Benzoni may indeed just about forgive you for the verify comments. Um, let me start right in the thick of what you, you've given us lots of things to talk about, but right in the thick of what you, uh, of the kind of heart of your speech, when you're talking you about... You right in the thick of Yes, it. all right. No, thanks. I'm about to edit, in fact, what you said. Um, uh, you called for um, an, uh, you know, an honest debate, a phrase we don't allow at the Institute, um, on what the relationship between ministers and civil servants should be. What would you say in that debate? What actually do you want to, uh, to change? I think, so. I think we need to be realistic about what ministers... Ministers won't like. Be, they like to be as forward as possible, and they like to be able to put themselves exactly where they feel like being, I would say. And I think we need to recognise what are they really able to do. They're there to set policy, they're not there to act as chief executives. Now, I'm in danger of repeating myself, but what I would say is that needs to be clearly drawn out. There needs to be a, they, they need to deliberately give up some of the power they've accumulated in favour of accounting officers. There needs to be a discussion where they say, I need you to tell me if this is going to work. You know, and what actually happens is a lot of the time it feels like, as far as I can tell, there's a cram down a lot of the time. That needs not cramming down would be a good idea. And what is their incentive to do that? Well, I, this is where I would say I'm going, to give a, I'm going to give a positive parallel to, a positive mention to the coalition. Where ministers stay in a particular office for longer, they tend to act, it tends to be that the consequences will come back to them of what they've done. I genuinely think better decisions were made under the coalition government because ministers knew that the deal was that they were in for kind of five years. And therefore they had a program, they had a job to do, and they tended to get on and do it, and they knew they were going to have to eat their own cooking, so to speak. Now, I think that was really positive. Now, am I saying we should have coalition? No, of course not. But the virtue of no, almost no machinery of government changes stable post-holding, uh, you know, it meant government got on with doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. None of I, that, by the way, needs to be peculiar to a coalition government. Yes, um, and I find that completely plausible. At the same time, you're, you're, you know, you're describing a set of circumstances uh, that pushed in a healthy direction then, but might not at other times. So, and, um, it's true. Do you think the accounting officer relationship really isn't working? now then, in terms of the accountability for value for money? When someone, when a minister decides to go in, 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 in when a minister decides to go in a direction which is likely to destroy value for money, can the accounting officer have any real imp impact on them? And my, it happens too often for the answer to that mm. to be yes, doesn't it? I mean, that's why I presented you with the evidence, and I could... I could reel off our whole portfolio. It shouldn't be happening this much at this mm. point. Mm. With the developing skills of the civil service, I would not expect things to be going wrong so often. That's a really interesting point. I mean, you've, so over your 10 years, you, you've described the coalition at the beginning. And do you think that the, um, the kind of lower rate of, of, of um, you know, egregiously bad decisions was because of the stability of, yeah, of I that? Do. Right. You, you think about things differently when you've got a long hold. You know mm. you're going to have to, you know, if you know that you might only be there for a year or a year and a half or something, whatever the average life of a minister can be, 
you think about it quite differently to how you think about it if you know you've got five years. Five years is a long cycle. You know, most things will come home to roost in five years. So you can afford, and you will get credit for what you've initiated. You've got five years to initiate. That's a reasonable amount of time to be reasonably deliberate and thoughtful yeah. about how you make things happen. All right, but we've got the circumstances we've got at the moment. We've got a minority government. We've got an enormously high change of ministers because of the B word. Um, and, um, you know, the government is doing what it can. What would you say in those circumstances about accountability? And about, I, how, about how to improve accountability? I would, I would, I would still say that I, I, I think there's a, a question of how laissez-faire the centre is or mm. how involved the centre gets. And I think if you say, it's always surprised me that some governments are very, very decentralised mm. and they don't appear to say, you know, we're all, when something, when a lot of things go wrong on your patch, it affects all of us, not just you. Mm. I would have expected that discussion to take place more often. I suspect it's taken place, it, I suspect it took place more under Blair less under mm. Cameron, there is, a, there, is a, there is a quite big variation. Mm. And at least in the current circumstances, if I was in the government, I would want to see no, no unne I mean, they've got enough difficult issues without unnecessary bad news hitting them. You're still leaving it down to the character of individual governments. I mean, do you think we need more watchdogs, or do, does the NAO need more teeth? Does Parliament need no. more ability to? No. This is government. This is we're talking. We. This is our system of government. I'm not trying to encroach on it. Our job is to be an objective observer, and you know, I'd rather, I, I, you know, I'd much rather have come to say at the end mm. of my term, you know, it's all glorious. Look, I can take a little bit of reflected credit for it. But I couldn't honestly say that when I took stock. So what I think is, no, you need government to work. We elect people to govern. That's clear. They need to be supported by the civil service. They need to let the civil service support them. Mm. And I still, mm. I still see a lot of examples where that's not sufficiently the case. Mm. And just finally, on this, this, the, are you saying that this government is showing an un unusually high degree of bad decisions? Unusual? No, I, I, that's too. You're asking too much for, of me. I can't. I can't say that. That would be unfair. I would just say, I've simply. Well, I mean, look. I've given you the evidence. You can draw your own conclusion. I didn't have to reach hardly off my outray to get that evidence. This is not five years worth. This is about three or four months worth. So, what do you think? <laughs> You've, um, you're indeed ed ending your t tenure with a great flurry of reports, children's social care, probation. But there are ferry, actually the ferries, same number ferries of reports. Without ferries. That, yes. Same number of reports we normally do, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Just that people are paying a bit more attention <laughs> to them because I'm going. <laughs> I think that's probably it. And possibly because of the state of the government as well. Um, okay, if you look back over 10 years, what have been your greatest hits? Um, In terms oh of the gosh. change you know the, 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 you know, the attention that they've attracted to something going wrong or the change that you've, you've brought? Um, that's quite a difficult one. I would say um, the, things I've in, the things I've felt really happy about are things where we've shown wider systems and wider interdependencies than those simply in one department. So I know it's regarded as banal now to say, you know, the whole of the primary primary care system runs across local government and, and, and uh, also the health service and so forth. And ne needing to see things as a system like that, that's now the property of the NHS. They talk about it a great deal. Back when we started with that, they weren't, well, let's, let's say I'll take shares in it in, in developing that view. So when you see big connected systems, that's when we do something that actually not very many other people in government do. It's still a very solo structure. We're at our most useful when we point mm. things out like that. I was pretty mm. proud of our short, our recent report on planning, mm. where I found, where we were talking about the fact that you can't protect value for money unless you plan in the medium term and plan properly. And I was very happy that the <coughs> Treasury is moderately, of course, they'd always thought of it for themselves and everything else like that, but they were moderately accepting 
of what we had to say, quite positive about it, and I believe it will influence their behaviour, which is really what matters. What matters to me is not scoring points, but actually seeing improvement in government. And I, I'm, I would, I'm sorry to sound a bit sanctimonious, but that actually is my motivation. You know, a lot of the time, what we do, we're not the ones who are running the government. All we do is make you know, it's, I've, I always liken myself to some squawking crow on a branch, sort of squawking away irritatingly. But if you squawk for long enough, it's surprisingly effective and changes behaviour. And that's what we're mm. trying to do, changing outcomes mm. in government. Mm. How have you picked the subjects you've gone for? Well, a lot of them pick themselves. Um, so Sort of. But I mean, what, because there is a big... Well, Public because of, well, they pick themselves this way. All right. So we do every year, every two years we do a, a report now a very authoritative report on financial sustainability of of, of, of health. Uh, when we started that, it was quite an ambitious experiment. Uh, that was in Andrew Lickman's time. Nice to see you, Andrew. But we we started that looking at the whole of the health system, its financial sustainability. Now that's an authoritative thing. So obviously we're going to do that on a regular basis. Once you commit to, we've just, we're, before I go, we're going to publish our first piece of work on trade negotiations in the EU. And it's going to be a kind of foundation piece talking about the interaction between um, individual departments and the Department for International Trade. Has that yet been clearly thought through? How are we going to deliver a unified effort, particularly when you times 30 it? Hmm. Now, I, th that's the first stone in a long staircase. Once we're on it, we're going to travel that, you know? Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm making it clear to you that it's not as if I sit there and think, I wonder what we're going to write a report about today. I and mean, it's not like that. A lot of it's, you see the structure, you see the logic, you follow, the, you follow that logic through. That means you do successive pieces of work. You know, we've done about, I don't know how many works on prim pieces of separate reports on primary care, four or five, mm. to fill out the picture of primary care, the GPs, the mm. local health visitors, and all of the other stuff like that. So a lot of the time, you find there's a natural logic, and then there are issues you start to see that you didn't know you were going to see. And mm. so, for example, I've mentioned culture. I had not clocked what a big difference, how strong culture in the civil service is in individual departments and what a big difference it makes to performance. Not necessarily bad, it's just there. And if you don't work with it as a force, you really don't know how to, you know, you can see you need to You mean manage. different from each other? Do oh, or, absolutely. Or, yeah. No, absolutely. And, and dependent, a lot of the time, dependent on what the, the key preoccupations and tasks of that department have been. And I'm just... So that's something I sort of learned this year, and I should have known it ages ago because I've been wrestling with the culture of the NAO. But, you know, I was really, I'm really fascinated by how that affects the ability of departments, particularly when they have to suddenly change from one style to another. It's quite a big, it's quite a big effort. I, I felt with Universal Credit that there was a team that had driven it for years. They'd been very strong about fending off criticism, making sure they got something to happen. And as a result, of course, they find it difficult to listen to contributions from outside, from people they see as their mm -hmm. natural opponents. Mm -hmm. It's difficult when they're actually telling, telling them something they really need to hear. And actually coming across that and having that discussion with them was quite enlightening to me, I must say. Mm -hmm. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's quite often the case. You suddenly find something new and, I'm, you know, and we do as an organisation and sometimes that's valuable to, mm -hmm. to government. Mm -hmm. You talked about the Home Office, uh, the context of Windrush, uh, that saying that that was predictable and fore forewarned. Do you think that they can change culture? I think they've got quite a long way to go still, I'll be honest. I think, I think it's hard to turn to a, to a department that's seen itself with a very strong in, enforcement mm. uh, job, and that's, we've given them that job. It's not their, you know, they didn't choose it, that's their job. And to say, I want that to coexist with a... You know, they've made, a, they've made a considerable effort, but I still feel there's further to go, to be quite frank. We've just published a report saying that they may not be the right department to look after migration after Brexit. Yeah. You think that's right? Could well be. Yeah. But, you know, but it depends how much they want to be that department and how far they're prepared to go at the change. Yeah. 
The trouble is, I would say, they've got too much on their plate. They've got a massive amount on their plate. It's one of the most difficult departments mm -hmm. in government. Always has been, I'm quite sure. But they've got massive issues on their plate at the moment. I mean, I mentioned, I mentioned the emergency services communications. There's just so much. There's the travails of the police with funding and everything else. All of that comes through them. So I think it's, mm. I think it's in one of the mm. hardest jobs in government. Mm. Uh, mm. And so maybe taking something off their plate if they didn't take it as an insult would be a positive thing for them. Mm. On Brexit itself, is it possible to say how much it's cost? No, not really. Uh, not, not, not really, because you, you've got to start by saying an awful lot of, you know, you'd have to think about what the opportunity cost was, you know. So a lot, a lot of work has been done by civil servants who are already there. There has been, you know, a, a lot of additional spend. Some of the spend, for example, to insure against, um, you know, I suppose it's a hard Brexit, Brexit the sort of insurance policy stuff, some of that will pay off against a transition. Now, if we, if we suddenly find ourselves with a deal for 18 months down the road, that time is going to evaporate mm -hmm. in seconds. And then having things that work that you've had to do in the, under this emergency, some of those may turn out to be permanently valuable rather than just temporary, temporary insurance policies. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if the chief system ended off having quite a long happy life on borders, the chief customs system, uh, as we wait for the new system to fully develop. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. So it's not easy to say at this stage. It would be easier to say in hindsight, of course, that's when we all have our fun. But, uh, and I suspect there'll be an industry of inquiries into various different features uh, of, of, of Brexit. But, but I can't put a, I don't think the worry or the primary concern, and I have not focused primarily on worrying about cost. I've, I've focused primarily on avoiding calamity and people doing reasonable things to try and mitigate our much greater risk. Almost nothing I've seen on Brexit expenditure, am I going to call out and say there's shocking waste in preparing for Brexit? I don't think that's right. I think what most of what's been done has been reasonable in the circumstances. It may not look so reasonable in future, but right now it looks pretty reasonable considering the unknown risks that we're going in, that we might be going into. You famously said that the government's planning on Brexit uh, was like a chocolate orange that could fall apart. Where, where are we on this chocolate orange? Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat my flip answer that we've got a chocolate cricket ball now. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, it's better. It's be a huge amount of work has gone mm. in. Government has worked really hard. I mean, the civil service has worked really hard at this. Mm. And we're still exposed. If, if there's a hard Brexit, we are, there are things that will definitely go wrong just because the accumulation of risks is too great. The accumulation of projects that were started at a certain point in time and have been pursu pursued at about double the speed normally used for projects, the accumulation of that means there's a, there's a, there's a substantial risk overhang there and the I, I predict with confidence that something will go wrong or I don't know exactly what it will be. Hmm. So uh, that's where we are. Okay. Cricket ball travelling in several directions at once. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you, you talked about the transparency agenda, and I wondered whether you thought freedom of information had been helpful, had been unhelpful in um, discouraging civil servants and ministers from writing as much down, or whether it just sits there on the side and the transparency <coughs> agenda, as you said, gets some, um, it, it just isn't much talked about. Well, I don't think freedom of information is an excuse for not pursuing transparency as a policy objective. Mm in answer to your question, that's, mm. and that's what I was trying to say earlier. Mm. I really think we should recognise that if you, if you want people not to be cynical about government, tell them more, not less. Mm. And it just, you know, if it, people generally assume that if you're not telling them something, there's a reason for it, and it's not probably going to be a good reason. People aren't going to fondly, oh, he's being secretive, I bet, I bet he's playing something really nice. <laughs> That's not human nature. That's not how people work, is it? So, come on, you know, we actually, this is, why not treat this as, you know, we're all paying our subs for this club called the UK, why not treat us as if we were kind of entitled to know what's going on? 
So what would you like, in, uh, for the public's behalf, uh, the government to publish or be transparent about that it isn't at the moment? Well, I think if we got the habit of saying what the program, what, if, if, if departments got in the habit of saying what their program was, what degree of difficulty it had, what they were going to try, what risks they were incurring, why they were trying to do this, why they thought it would be good for people. I mean, you might say, oh, well, that's all in the front half of a set of accounts, the bit that nobody ever looks yeah. at. But if we actually set out to say, we're going to engage with our public, talk about what we're trying to do, and then be accountable against that. Why not? Why not? Hmm. I'd like to see more of that. Do you ever hear from Theresa May on the resp response? To oh, she very course. kindly complimented me uh, in, in the debate where she was appointing my successor. She said I'd shown integrity. And, and I'm writing her a letter to thank her for her kind words. Word. Well, no, it means she. It means she doesn't agree with you. I think. <laughs> well, I'm sure. No, no, and I have. I have actually met her too. Uh, I, I was invited as a uh, Scotsman. Uh, the number ten decided a year ago or so to have a Burns night supper, and they were clearly a bit short of Scotsmen. <laughs> they invited me, and I saw the Prime Minister and decided. I'm not going to be in the same room as you and not go and say hello to you. So I steamed up to say hello. It was a brief conversation. And have you heard from Chris Grayling? Chris Grayling invites me to see him every now and again. Um, <laughs> and we have a conversation, which is, you know, we have a conversation. And he says, I was disappointed by what you said in that report. I don't think it's quite fair. And I say, I'm sorry, I think it was fair, Minister. And then we, that's it, kind of, more or less. <laughs> On that note, I do indeed have many more questions, but I think there are going to be a lot here. Let me go here. All right. There are loads of hands. Brilliant. Um, for, right, first up was in the middle over there, and then I'm going to come forward. Simon Judge, Cabinet Office. Um, Amy, so it's a bit of an impression from what you said that all the NEO does is produce the published reports and then the theatre of the PAC and so on. I wonder if you could say a bit more about some of the other ways that the NEO works and tries to change the culture in departments because I don't think the published reports are a very effective way of changing culture but I know you've done quite a bit on that I wonder what your reflections are on that no, well. okay well that's that, that's that's fair enough well um, obviously we first of all we, are, we we audit the central we do financial audits of the central government and that means we have quite a close relationship with the finance teams and and management and uh, I meet with uh, I have a review meeting with departments once a year. We're in touch a lot more often than that. And we have an agenda of trying to uh, manage value. So we're going to do these pieces of work and look in depth at, into departments. We're very keen to convey value back to them. So when we're planning a piece of work, we say, well, we're going to do this piece of work anyway. But while we're doing it, can we do anything that's useful to you? Can we? And, you know, and, and by the way, I would also say we go and see the department and talk about the value we believe there is in the work we've done. Admittedly, whether they're feeling generally the right time to do that is a bit after the report has been published. Um, but I try and do it in, in, beforehand. We have a presentation of preliminary findings where we haven't written the report. We go and see the department and say, this is what we're thinking of writing. And we deliberately want the department to be able to contribute to that. And sometimes it's interesting, they, you know, if you're talking to the perm set, they'll say, no, I quite agree about that, but I really don't, I think you've got that wrong. Depends, and, and our reaction to that will depend entirely on the evidence. But at least it's an engaged conversation that we have. We are trying to have this open discussion and make sure that they get as much, they understand why we think what we do. We listen to them and... Uh, then we have another discussion afterwards. So that's so we're trying to have that much more engaged, valuable relationship if we can, but not at the expense of sort of frankly uh, cutting slack on on what we report. So that's it's making headway, uh, and and uh, and I think it's important for us to do that. Great. Here in the, in the second row. Hi, I'm Leslie Ann Nash, also Cabinet Officer. We've met before. We have met Amy, thank you for remembering. Um, I fear that um, stability of ministers is a bit of a pipe dream. 
In the five years I've been in the Cabinet Office, I've had as many ministers. Much of that departure has not been um, Brexit related. There is, however, despite the merry-go-round at Perm Sex at the moment, a real stability across the civil servant at DG and director level. How do we create an environment where we as DGs and directors feel we have permission to work against that optimism bias and actually speak truth unto power and call out that our to-do list is too big, actually, and so some of the projects fell because of that? Okay. Well, thanks for agreeing with the basic analysis. And what I guess I'd say is um, that's a really interesting challenge. I think you, that's a discussion that needs to primarily happen. I mean, I'd be happy to participate in it. It needs to happen within the civil service. I've often thought that civil service, I mean, there, there have been some heads of civil service who seem to me not to support their people very strongly to argue with ministers or to try and push back. I, my impression may be wrong. I don't feel as I'm a, an expert on the internals of the civil service, but I, I think civil service will never do that if they don't believe they're supported by their own senior cadres. How could they possibly? If they think, you know, if I put this, if I take a strong line on this, you know, it's my career, that's, or I won't get a promotion or whatever, that's not gonna happen. So the only way this could possibly work is if it's really strongly supported from within the civil service. I think, well, and what I've said is sincere about seeing the improvement in and the more positive, the more positive, and if I can say it, slightly more, somewhat more managerial attitude in the civil service. That consequent logic would point you towards picking issues where there's strong evidence and saying, look, this just looks really wrong. You can't make progress past a certain point until you start fighting those issues a bit. I really think that's true. So I think I'm not, I'm not hopeless about the dialogue. And by the way, the reason I don't, I think you could have a policy of saying we don't want to move ministers all the time. I don't think it's a pipe, pipe dream because it's actually happened in the quite recent past. So, I, you know, to just say, oh, well, you can't possibly do that. Don't give up on that so easily would be my advice. But on the other one, maybe the time for that has come, for that discussion to take place within the civil service. All right, two, two behind. Okay. Yep. Amy, it's uh, Una O'Brien, former permanent secretary at the Department of Health. Um, thank you so much for what you've said today. I think you've opened a, a very important uh, chapter in the debate about the relationship between accounting officers and ministers, and perhaps it's, it's timely. Uh, I do reflect on one particular uh, thought going back, let's say, 15, 20 years. I mean, one of the reasons why the deliverology got going under Michael Barber, why ministers became more and more interested in delivery, was because there were some huge shortcomings in the civil service. And things have changed. They are changing. Maybe they haven't yet gone far enough for the political class to have the level of confidence that they need in the civil service. But I certainly think you've pointed out uh, a really important topic for debate. So thank you very much for that. I wanted to just ask you uh, on a completely separate matter, going out back to politicians, you've worked with two uh, incredibly uh, influential and powerful women as chair of the PAC, Margaret Hodge and now Meg Hillier. And I wonder if you could say something about how that relationship works with, with the chair of the PAC and, and the committee in general, because uh, clearly there is uh, an important dialogue that happens there when it comes to the agenda for the, for the NEO. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for both, both of those, including whether civil servants deserve the confidence of ministers. Okay, okay well, let me start with the second one. Um, I think they've both, I mean, there's been quite a strong evolution in both of them. I uh, say with Margaret, we started off fighting like cat and dog, actually. Um, and it turned into, I and mean, we're friends now, we meet, for, we meet regularly now. I mean, I really like Margaret, we're good friends. Uh, she would say that too, so I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, but I like, she's, so she's, she's a fantastic person, apart from anything else. Um, so, getting to a space where you're independent, and you're, in, and you're actually independent of the PAC as well, and you're, but you're in the same space, if you're both moderately strong personalities, making that work can, needs a bit of working out. 
and uh, in particular, if, you've, if your pre previous experience has been being a minister and you think, well, you know, what I need to do is make sure these guys, this is, this, is, uh, this is the equivalent of a civil servant, I need to make sure we've got it straight who's in charge here. And that can be quite an interesting set of conversations. Um, but it turned out, we it turned out to work very, very well together actually. And um, Meg, is, Meg, is, Meg and I have naturally started much closer and, and it's just worked much more smoothly than that. So I would, I would say, um, and, and she's, uh, she's got a different, very different personal style. So I would say that's a, I mean the, the relationship with Meg has worked right the way through. So, so uh, no, it's been interesting. But I, I like working with, um, uh, and very happy to, 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 to work with strong women, and I actually think it's probably easier and more fun than working with strong men. Just that, well, because they're generally a bit more insightful and interested in what you might be feeling <laughs> than the guys are, I would say. That's my experience of it. Uh, as, far as, as far as the civil service are concerned, very quickly, you have to say that they're ready now. You can't be waiting until, what, what are they going to do, pass an exam or something? No, I mean, the time, if, if you want them to act, they're, sh they're, they're moving up and you need them to be able to act up. Otherwise, you're going to start demonstrate. you're starting to discourage them. You, if, they're, if they're accumulating skill and ability and showing courage in their judgments, you need to encourage and reinforce that and they'll, f they'll move into the space available. If what you do instead is to say, boy, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to arbitrarily cut across you all the time, then you're actually demonstrating to them that you don't like this behaviour. So you can't have it both ways. I think for ministers, if they want them to play that role, the talent and the intellect is definitely there. It needs the encouraging, welcoming attitude. I'm not sure I sold that to you, but that's my best shot. Okay. We're going to have, we have to press on here in the front. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Langdale from Arcadis. Obviously, you've talked about ministers, counting officers in the civil service. You've not mentioned the kind of fourth party in the room, i.e. the firms to whom the billions of public expenditure go to. It's after all the case that to win the contracts to deliver often over-ambitious, badly thought through programs and projects, bidders in the nature of public procurement effectively have to say, your idea is brilliant, we can do it, we know how to. In fact, they are joined into the conspiracy. I wonder, I wonder whether you, you think there is a role, indeed an accountability, that those that take public money have, um, going back to your points about speaking truth to power, and in that three-way dialogue you think needs to evolve between ministers, accounting officers, and civil servants, what role do you think um, uh, suppliers should play, or are they just, in the end, dumb contractors who should get on and do what they're commissioned to do? <laughs> Very good. Uh, but, but you could have left that last bit out and you were, because you were shaping my reply a little bit more than I need. Um, I, 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 the first thing I'd say is anybody who contracts with government needs to understand that government doesn't have the same equipment as a private sector customer. And if that looks like an opportunity to you, you need to think very carefully. Because government has got different weapons to the private sector. If it goes wrong in government, it's going to be your fault. And by the way, they can say things about you in parliament that you won't believe, which will really damage your brand. So the idea that is, so you might be better at negotiating and you might say all these things and set them up and boy, you'll be sorry for it in the end. There are very few people who come out of it thinking long term this is a, w is a winning strategy. And I'm not, you weren't advocating that, I know. But it's just important to understand that there, it's just a different beast with different expertise and it will tend to make, if you just say yes to them, they will make mistakes and you'll end off suffering just as much as they do for those mistakes. That's my general experience. So you can't afford just to go along with them, sorry. So in your mise-en-scene, where they were just saying, yes, that's quite right, you can't do that. You've actually got to act like a business and be, be hard-headed about what you can deliver. If you promise and contract to deliver something that you know perfectly well you can't deliver, bad luck. You take the consequences of that. 
I think you can engage, you can bring your, no your superior knowledge and resources, and mostly I think government will be quite open to receiving information and ideas from you. You need to offer them up. You know, push in there, push in there with your ideas, that's what I would suggest. But don't, but, but you know, but, but as a general rule, I would say never contract, if, if it just sounds goofy, don't say you'll do it. Otherwise you're putting yourself in an impossible situation. And the difference is, you've got a contract that you've got to abide by, and they're the government. So I would be very careful about that. Even more hands going up. Um, all right, uh, here, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Alex Schofield, I work at the Ministry of Justice on Legal Aid Strategy. Um, you've spoken this morning about efficiency in public spend. Um, we have a desire to make legal aid more user-friendly. Um, I wanted to know your views on how the civil service can help the most vulnerable benefit from public services, including legal aid, when the concept of vulnerability is so difficult to measure or define. Well, obviously there, there are two, two levels to that. First of all, I mean, the civil service can help um, and does help in many cases in the services they, they, they deliver. So, you know, there are a lot of services that directly go to, a, to our citizens um, and they can help with that. The other thing they can do slightly more critically is they cannot uh, operate an sight, out of sight, out of mind policy which says it's okay to give swinging cuts to local government who deliver a lot of these services because it doesn't affect us. That's not good enough, I'm sorry. That's actually really not good enough in my view. So I would offer a challenge to that. And secondly, I think you can encourage that there be a real debate on prioritization of where the money should go. People would be quite interested and tickled to take part in that discussion, you know. It is actually, we're all paying for this. How about asking us what we'd like to do? And I think the more you engage with people and ask them, you know, generally, in, whenever you're dealing with the general public, the more you engage with them, listen to them, react to them, the more you get into a positive cycle. And I'm saying that not as a general statement, but over various projects and programs where more or less of that has gone on. When you invent something in a back room, put it onto the public, and then you're surprised that they don't like it or they're pretty upset about it, or they seek representatives to campaign against you for doing it, don't be surprised. That's not how they like being treated. I'm getting one more, and I'm incredibly sorry. Um, middle, um, at the back, look, I'll try and take two. So, yeah, yeah, you, yes, you, and. Hi there, um, Johnny Monroe, GK Strategy. I was just wondering if you could talk about the- I didn't the hear that. Sorry, uh, Johnny Monroe, um, GK Strategy. I was just okay. wondering if you could talk about the upcoming spending review, because I know that you previously had criticisms about the way that they're run, and I know that the IFG has done a lot of work on uh, the fact that they need to improve the process. I was just wondering if you could talk about that. That's a big subject. Um, what would I say? Uh, I get the feeling it's going to be a pretty tight old spending review and a lot of people are going to have some bad news, okay, is what I think. And I think when deciding where the money needs to go, there needs to be a bit of a thought process about connection. So. In, I'm not getting, I am not a consultant to the NHS, but I'm going to say, having put a 10 year plan in place for the NHS and given them a funding deal, if you then don't fund some of the other elements in the cost, like, you know, the arrears in, <coughs> serious arrears in maintenance, because the capital budget has been being used to support revenue costs for the last, I don't know, five years. If you don't do, if you don't recognize the connectivity between one thing and another, if you don't have enough money in local government to provide social services, that will have a negative effect on the NHS. That will mean the NHS has been pulled to do more than it ought to do. So all I'd ask for in this review is that it be thoughtful about things of that sort, rather than simply saying, well, actually, we'll just list, we'll just, we'll just preside over as, you know, a sort of battle. I mean, there are going to have to be decisions, prioritization decisions. It'd be nice to hear what the rationale for that was. We are really sadly going to have to stop. I'm very, very sorry to the many hands up. It's a sign of a terrific discussion when there are not, not any loads of hands up throughout, but more going up as we go on. 
Um, or maybe it's a sign that you haven't answered things. But anyway, that seems... That seems <laughs> well, haven't I done? <laughs> You've answered lots of questions. Uh, my, mine and uh, terrific questions from the audience. Um, can you join me very much thanking Amy Morse?